Welcome back to our If God Made the Universe small group Bible study. You are now halfway through the series, but I assure you the best is yet to come. Today, Dr. Ross will be tackling an issue that has been raised by many skeptics concerning why an omniscient God would create such a massive universe over billions of years if it was only to be inhabited by humans for such a brief period of time. They question why an all-powerful God would be so seemingly wasteful and inefficient which is a good, solid concern. Now I'd like you to prepare yourself for some good, solid answers from Dr. Ross. In session number five, if God made the universe, why so much for so little? If God made the universe, why is there so much for so little? You know, as we've been going through the first four sessions here, what we've been noticing is that the universe screams of purpose purpose for itself and purpose for the human species. Everywhere we look in the universe, we find reasons to believe in humanity's high value, ultimate destiny, and glorious purpose. And there are multiple evidences for this cosmic purpose. And we've covered two already of these uh, purposes. And the first is something that we talked about uh, in our last session, the anthropic principle. Actually, we've been giving you pieces of this. I've been going through the first four episodes. How when we astronomers look at the universe, everywhere we look, every time and place we look, we see overwhelming evidence that has been extraordinarily fine-tuned or designed for the specific benefit of the human species. And if you recall, we had a couple of episodes where we looked at the amazing fact that we human beings are living at the one time in the entire history of the universe where we get to observe the whole of cosmic history, including our capacity to look back in time and directly witness the cosmic creation event, actually see God bringing into existence matter, energy, space, and time. Now, it's not only that we are placed at the one time where we can see everything, we're also at that unique location. As vast as this universe is, with 50 billion trillion stars, and perhaps that many planets, we're living in the one location in the universe where we have the capacity to witness the entire history of the universe. If we were located anywhere else, uh, there would be light that would get in the way that prevent us from seeing the dim radiation, for example, from the cosmic creation event. We're now going to look at a third in this particular session, and it's called the Anthropic Principle in Equality. And let me uh, just review for you what we covered in our last session, a definition that we ended up with of the Anthropic Principle, that the amazing cosmic fine-tuning that we see in hundreds of different characteristics of the universe for humanity's specific benefit shows that at least one purpose for the universe is to provide a home for us human beings. And this is something astronomers have been studying now for over 40 years. And as I mentioned, one astronomer, Paul Davies, says when we look at the universe, we see overwhelming evidence that has been designed for the benefit of us human beings. But years ago in Britain, a cosmologist by the name of Brandon Carter discovered something in these characteristics that point to the design of the universe for humans' benefit, and he coined it the anthropic principle in equality. And what he noted was that the laws of physics that uh, we see in the universe require a minimum of about 14 billion years in order to prepare a home for human beings. As he pointed out, it might be conceivable that we could have humans coming upon the cosmic scene in more than 14 billion years, but not in anything less. That's the minimum that's required given the laws of physics that govern the universe. But he pointed out those same laws of physics and same cosmic characteristics require that humans cannot live in a civilized state where they're actually cooperating with one another specializing in trading for anything more than 41,000 years. And other astronomers and physicists have calculated that it may be less than those 41,000 years. Hence the inequality. It takes billions of years to prepare a home for human beings, and yet we can live in a civilized state 
for only a few tens of thousands of years uh, maximum. I mean, there's a factor of a million difference between the minimum time needed to prepare, prepare a home for us and the maximum time we can live in a civilized state. And Brandon Carter not only gave us the physical evidence for this inequality, he actually talked about the philosophical implications of that inequality. And before I go there, uh, let me just take you through some of the evidences that we have today for why this inequality must be true. And we gave you a hint of this in our last session, looking at uranium and thorium, and how we noted that you can't have a planet with continents and oceans on the surface unless you have powerful, long-lasting uh, plate tectonics. And the energy that drives that plate tectonics is uranium and thorium in the interior of the Earth, long-lived radiometric elements. And it's their radioactivity that provides the energy that drives the plate tectonics that makes possible a planet with both oceans and continents on its surface. And it's also the energy that makes possible a strong, stable magnetic field that persists for billions of years. And so without the uranium and thorium, we wouldn't have that magnetic field. Without that magnetic field, we wouldn't be protected from X-ray and uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, coming in from the sun and cosmic sources. And uh, neither would we have the protection necessary to prevent the sun from sputtering away our atmosphere. So we need this uranium and thorium. But as we pointed out in our last session, it takes time for the universe to build up the uranium and thorium that we need. In fact, it's critical that our planet form at that moment when uranium and thorium are at maximum abundance. And as we explained in our last session, that takes a little more than 9 billion years. And that's when the Earth formed, about 4.5 billion years ago. Now, uh, that's one reason, too, you want to wait more than those 9 billion years. It takes time for the radioactivity that's built into the Earth to decline to where it's safe for advanced life. So that explains why we see in the history of Earth's life, it starts off as simple and primitive. It can handle the radiation. And uh, the Lord, the Creator, waits about uh, uh, 4 billion years to put human beings on the scene because we can't handle a lot of radiation. Uh, however, uh, the Creator can't put us here much later. If He puts us here much later, there won't be adequate radioactivity to sustain the magnetic field and to sustain the plate tectonic activity. So that kind of gives you a feel. There's a relatively narrow window demanded by uranium and thorium in which we human beings uh, can thrive here on planet Earth. But also it takes a long time uh, to get into that window. I'm going to show you several more windows. Uh, this one is uh, you know, fairly broad for human existence. I'm going to show you one a little bit narrower. And it has to do with the luminosity of the sun. Uh, the sun uh, begins to uh, uh, get uh, brighter uh, when it's forming, collecting gas, and then it starts to lose mass and it gets dimmer. And then as it uh, burns in its nuclear furnace, hydrogen into helium, uh, it gets hotter and hotter because the helium is denser than the hydrogen. And uh, there's a brief window that takes a very narrowly fine-tuned luminosity of the sun in which we humans can exist. And so we have to wait, or the crater waits, until the sun reaches that just right luminosity for human beings, and he creates us. Now, what the crater's been doing uh, throughout the past 3.8 billion years of life is making sure he has just the right life on the planet at just the right time, with just the right abundance and diversity, so that that life can chemically alter our Earth's atmosphere, so that it traps more heat or less heat, so as the sun's luminosity is changing, the temperature on the surface of the Earth remains ideal. And what's been going on for the past three billion years is God's been putting <coughs> life on the planet, different life at different times, to draw more and more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter and brighter, the atmosphere gets less and less capable of uh, retaining that solar heat. So the temperature remains ideal, but there's a limit. Um, because if we take any more of those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, 
it's going to affect photosynthetic uh, life. I mean, photosynthetic <coughs> life takes carbon dioxide and water, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, and through photosynthesis converts that into sugars, starches, and fats. Uh, but if we pull any more carbon dioxide and water out of our atmosphere, photosynthetic efficiency will drop, and eventually photosynthesis will actually come to an end. Which means about 10 million years from now, human life will be impossible here on planet Earth. 30 million years, all life goes <coughs> extinct as the sun gets brighter and brighter. So that gives you a feel for why we need the 14 billion years, but why we humans can exist for only a short time within those 14 billion years. Another has to do with the growth of the continents. Once again, it takes about 9 billion years before we can have a planet like Earth, uh, but Earth starts off as a water world, no continents. It takes plate tectonic activity uh, to take the basalts at the bottom of the ocean floor and uh, hydrate them, turn them into uh, silicates, silicates being lighter, float above the basalts, and as that goes on for a period of time, eventually continents pop up above the surface uh, of the uh, waters. And uh, here you can see uh, what the growth of the continents has been like uh, through uh, the past four and a half billion years of the history of the Earth. And there's a continental land coverage uh, of the surface of the Earth that's optimal for human life and human civilization. The number is 29%. And so it's taken that four and a half billion years to get to that 29% level, and in the future, it'll exceed that 29% level. So again, there's that narrow time window when we had just the right continental landmass coverage on the surface of the Earth, that nutrients are recycled appropriately, we get the maximum food production, in the oceans and on the continental land masses to sustain human civilization. And then we have atmospheric oxygen. And one of the amazing things about our planet Earth is it's exceptionally oxygen rich. <coughs> oxygen, as many of you know, makes up about 48% of the total uh, stuff of planet Earth. Uh, but when the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago, that oxygen was not in a free form that could be used by advanced life. And so God created different species of life at different times, making sure the right life was here at the right time, so that that life through photosynthetic activity, because that's what happens, you know, photosynthetic uh, plants will take water and carbon dioxide, convert it into sugar, starches, and fats, but a byproduct is free oxygen. And so that photosynthetic life begins to oxygenate the planet. But our planet is loaded with oxygen sinks. And so it's necessary to fill up all the rust basins, if you like, on uh, the surface of the Earth. And once those rust basins are filled up, now you can begin to build up uh, free oxygen in the atmosphere. And we humans need about 20, 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. And so it takes time uh, for that photosynthetic life to take it up to the just right level. But you don't want too much oxygen or too little oxygen. I mean, I remember a couple of decades ago, they were opening up these oxygen bars where you could go and breathe pure oxygen. You can get kind of a high. You feel really good. Uh, but notice there aren't oxygen bars anymore. Uh, they've shut them all down because we realize it causes our metabolism to run too fast, and it's actually an aging uh, effect. And so 20, 21% is where you want to be. No more, uh, no less. And if you've got more oxygen, not only will we uh, wear out faster, age faster, but you get more forest fires and grass fires. But if you don't have adequate oxygen, then we can't maintain the necessary level of activity uh, for advanced human civilization to be possible. So we're in that narrow time window when life on planet Earth gives us exactly the right oxygen levels. And incidentally, as God is packing the earth with life, and I really do mean that, what we see in the fossil record is throughout the past 3.8 billion years, our planet has had the maximum biomass at the maximum uh, biodiversity. Different life at different times, because God, after all, uh, is compensating for the changing physics of the earth, the moon, and the sun. 
but it's always at a maximal level that the laws of physics will permit. And that maximal level is what enriches the human population with biodeposits. Coal, oil, natural gas embedded in the crust of the earth, thanks to all these generations of light that preceded us. And incidentally, uh, don't take the metals for granted. Uh, most of the metals that we harvest were concentrated by sulfate-reducing bacteria. So when you celebrate Thanksgiving, you might want to put in a word for um, uh, thanking God for uh, packing the earth with sulfate-reducing bacteria for so many billions of years so that you could actually have silverware on your Thanksgiving uh, and you know, have uh, lights and chairs and so forth. Uh, they've already uh, blessed us. So uh, we have all that uh, thanks to uh, all this photosynthetic life and life in general before us. And then we have uh, the physics of the sun. And stars are a lot like human beings. They're very unstable when they're young, and they're very unstable when they're old. <laughs> they're maximally stable when they're middle age. And uh, you know, this is what all stars go through. When they're young, they're uh, pouring out uh, flares uh, of great intensity and abundance, and at the same time showering their environment uh, with X-ray and hard ultraviolet radiation. And again, uh, certain bacteria can handle that, but not advanced life. But as the sun gets older and older, it becomes progressively more and more stable, less and less flaring activity, and less and less X-ray radiation uh, being poured out. And then it reaches a minimum, and then as it begins to age beyond that, the flaring activity increases, the X-rays increase, and what we notice when we look at the flaring history of our star, the sun, we are living at the moment when the sun is most stable, the flares are the least, and the X-ray radiation is the least intense. Uh, we are at that ideal uh, period of maximum stability in the sun's history. This is true of all stars, but one of the things we notice about our star, the sun, it's got the optimal mass. Stars that are more massive than the sun are more unstable at all of their ages. Stars that are less massive than the sun are more unstable at all of their ages. Stars that are exactly the mass of the sun have the optimal uh, luminosity stability and the optimal uh, spectral uh, response that's ideal for advanced life. So we have the best possible mass for our star, the sun. It's got the optimal mass. Uh, the flaring minimum occurs when it's 4.57 billion years old, which is the age of the sun right now. But something astronomers discovered uh, almost a decade ago in looking at neutrinos coming out of the sun, uh, those are exotic mass particles that uh, we've talked about uh, earlier, uh, flowing out of the sun. And as we observed those neutrinos, it told us that the sun entered an exceptionally stable luminosity phase beginning about 50,000 years ago. They also noticed from the same neutrinos that that extreme solar luminosity stability can only be sustained for another 50,000 years. So that kind of gives you a feel. There's only a 100,000 year wide window when you've got the optimal st stability uh, for advanced human civilization. And incidentally, the uh, best dates we have for God creating uh, the human species, Adam and Eve, and all of their descendants, comes in at roughly 50,000 years ago. Here, bars are about 20, 30, 40,000 years, but uh, certainly something less than 90,000 years, and it could be uh, a little bit briefer. So, and the cultural evidence tells us about 50,000 years ago. So it's like God placed human beings on the planet the moment the sun entered this exceptionally stable luminosity phase, and as we're going to see in later sessions, He's going to fulfill the purpose of humanity in this universe and the creation to come uh, in just uh, a few thousand years more or less. So extreme solar stability uh, lasts only 100,000 years. Now, if you pick up our book of why the universe is the way it is, you actually see we talk about 20 different time windows, all quite narrow. And the amazing thing is all of those time windows line up at the same time. We could easily see if the physics were slightly different, those windows might go all over the place. But if they do, there'd be no possibility for humans ever existing in the universe. 
But the universe is designed in such a way that all 20 of these narrow time windows line up at the same time so that we humans can exist in a civilized state. And some of these windows are much narrower than the 100,000 years. Uh, our best calculations of reasons to believe tell us that we're probably looking at 20,000 years or less. Now, you might be a little bit concerned, wondering, well, you know, how long has human civilization been around? Because I want to know how much longer I got before everything's going to check out. Well, when we talk about humans in a civilized state, we mean when humans reach a level of uh, sophistication where they begin to specialize in their occupations. So there might be one village where they focus on animal husbandry, raising goats, for example. Another village might focus on uh, raising grains, and another on pottery, uh, another on uh, you know, building uh, trade implements. So you have these towns that begin to specialize and trade with one another. That describes what uh, archaeologists and anthropologists call the Neolithic Revolution. And uh, the best evidence tells us that that Neolithic Revolution began about 11,000 years ago. So if we're talking 20,000 years, we got 9,000 years left. Uh, but my friends who are interested in this idea of, uh, you know, what does it take uh, for advanced uh, high-tech civilization have calculated, if you're talking the level of high-technology civilization that we're sustaining today, it can be realistically sustained no matter what kind of technological advances come in the future for a maximum of a thousand years. Of course, we can always choose to go to a less technologically uh, you know, level of civilization. Go back to the Stone Age, we can extend our window a little bit. But if you're talking civilization, the more advanced it is, the shorter the window becomes. Now, Brandon Carter looked at all this and said, okay, we got thousands of years, tens of thousands at most, in which we humans can live in a civilized state, but we know from the same physics it takes 14 billion years minimum for all this to get prepared and ready for human beings. And remember one of the quote I gave you from Freeman Dyson? When we astronomers look at the universe, we can't avoid the conclusion that somehow the universe knew we were coming. It's not just Christian astronomers that say that. Regardless of the theological perspective of the astronomer, we recognize that in looking at the universe, it seems it was prepared and advanced, designed and advanced for us human beings. Now, Brandon Carter developed an analogy to draw the philosophical significance of this incredible inequality. But I want to give credit to my wife for providing me, which I think is a superior analogy. And it's the wedding ceremony. And as some of you know, I'm not just an astronomer, I'm also a pastor. And I've done a number of weddings over the past uh, many years. And uh, you know the weddings that I have performed, I've checked with other people that have performed weddings. Uh, here in America, your typical wedding ceremony runs about 20 minutes long. Now, I'm not counting all the singing that might go on, but you know, just, just the ceremony itself is about 20 minutes. And if you throw in the singing, it's what, 40 minutes max? Uh, and, but I've also done some uh, research on the web to determine how much investment goes into a typical American wedding. And the typical American bride and her family, and these days it's both families, typically spend about a year preparing for that wedding day. And the total financial investment goes in, and this date is about three years old, but it was $20,000. That's a lot of money and a lot of time for something that lasts just 20 minutes. Now, I've made several trips to Asia. There, they spend way more money and a lot more time. Here in America, we kind of are, uh, you know, I don't know what the appropriate word is, not cheap, but uh, <laughs> uh, maybe putting, well, anyway, the whole point is it takes a lot of time and a lot of money for something that lasts such a short period of time. But none of us charges say, the father or the bride uh, with uh, financial insanity uh, for investing thousands of dollars. Nor do we charge the bride and all of her friends and bridesmaids, etc., with putting that much time into preparing for the wedding. Why? It's because we realize those 20 minutes have extremely high value 
and high purpose for the bride and the groom that are joining themselves together for the rest of their lives. And it's the value and the purpose of those 20 minutes uh, that tells us it's worth the investment of time and money. Well, likewise, Brandon Carter concluded, the only way you can explain this huge inequality, a far greater inequality than what we see in this wedding ceremony analogy, where there's a factor of a million difference between the uh, minimum time needed to make a home for us and the maximum time we can stay in a civilized state. He says the only possible explanation, there must be somebody beyond the universe that has an extremely high value for the human species and an extremely high purpose for the human species. Now, I don't know whether he's a Christian or not. Uh, I don't think he is just based on what he's written. But nevertheless, I think he was right. The only possible philosophical conclusion, we humans in the eyes of God must have an extremely high value and a very high purpose. Hey everybody. Okay, that wedding analogy is a really good one, don't you think? It even rings true to a penny-pinching Scotsman like me. God considers absolutely nothing wasted on us. Our value to Him extends far beyond time and space. My wife thinks it's wildly romantic that we were on God's mind during those billions of years of meticulous creating. He did it all for us because he loves us. But man, now that she's seen this, I probably need to start making plans for our next date night right away. All right, I'm going to go get started with that while you guys have your Q&A discussion. Be bold, make sure you get all your questions answered, and I'll see you at our next session. The preceding program was brought to you by Reasons to Believe and NRB TV. What about those who've never heard about Jesus Christ? Will they be saved? We know that in the Bible that we learn that everybody is given a conscience by God to know right and wrong. They have a sense that there is a God. We know that creation shows the